Thanks very much. It's uh, actually nice to see all of you come out at the end of a long semester and a long winter. <laughs> so I want to just say a few things about my uh, latest book just to open things up and uh, leave a lot of time for questions uh, so that we can get into a nice discussion, etc. Let me begin by saying that um, this book, uh, West African, uh, sorry, Owners of West Africa, I see it as a part of a larger set of studies that I've been working on, and that's looking at slavery in Africa. When people think of the Africa, and they put Africa and slavery together, of course, the first thing they think about is the Atlantic slave trade. And that's 12 and a half million people who crossed the, were forcibly uh, transported to the Americas. Uh, what people don't often think of when they think of Africa and slavery is the fact that there was a system of indigenous slavery within Africa itself, local slavery. Okay? So whereas you have 12 and a half million people, most of them were prisoners of war being put on uh, boats and shipped to the Americas, you also have hundreds of thousands, if not more, who were, who ne who were never got on the boats who were never sold and put on the boats, but were actually retained locally. So one of the first things that I tried to do was to give some voice to these individuals. There are lots of studies about the number of people who have been uh, exported to the Americas. There were a number of studies that talked about the warfare that generated prisoners of war, who were the vast majority, who were either shipped to the Americas or sold locally, you know, and kept locally as domestic slaves. But that's numbers. At some point, it's important to realize that these are people. They have individual experiences, they have individual lives and, and hopes and joys and pains and anguish. And so what I did in this particular book, West African Narratives of Slavery, which was published before this one, was to use a biographical approach, and I can pass this around, to understand what, how Africans themselves talked about their experiences, being captured in war, being ripped from their communities, uh, hearing that their entire families were dead, trying to escape, uh, et cetera, trying to go back home, trying to figure out what to do when abolition came. So that's this book. And having focused a lot on trying to get at that individual experience, and there are about five or six different people who are highlighted in this, I said, OK, so these are the people who experience this as uh, the enslaved. Uh, this book, I have to say, is also rather unusual. In the United States, you've got thousands of slave narratives. In Africa, there are very, very, very few. And so there are only two books that are able to focus on listening to what Africans themselves have to say about their experiences and trying to understand and interpret those experiences. But once I did this book, I said, what about the owners? You know, slavery takes two to tangle as such. You've got to have the enslaved, and you're going to certainly have people who own the slaves. And so I wanted to understand them. What were their motivations? What were their interests? And this book also is biographical in orientation. Uh, again, there's not a lot of information that is available. So I have three biographies of men, because I didn't have enough information about women who were slave owners. Okay, so I had to focus on the men. And because these societies are oral in orientation, there's not, a, there's not documentation. So one cannot necessarily find documents to determine how many people did they actually own, how did they use them, how did they treat them, uh, et cetera. We just don't have that information. Uh, instead, I wanted to look at when abolition came, how did they respond? Slave owners in this country decided to go to war, and you have the Civil War. You didn't have that happening in West Africa, but how did they respond to abolition? 
Abolition came in the United States as a result of the Civil War. Abolition in West Africa came as a result of colonialism. As you have colonial uh, powers, France, Britain uh, are the major ones, Portugal moving in, then they, at least on their books, say that they were not going to tolerate slavery. Slavery became illegal. The slave trade was Ill became illegal, and then once they gained colonial territory, uh, slavery was illegal. The British abolition of the slave trade began in 1807. Slavery and the abolition of slavery, at least in what is now Ghana, took place in 1875. It was a very slow process. So my question is, how did slave owners in this area respond to this? So I have three, again, three biographies, three men, and each of them handled it differently, okay? The, the, in focusing on this period, the late 19th, early 20th century, uh, I could use British documents about these individuals. I could use German missionary records because the Germans were operating in southeastern Ghana, and so they had some uh, writings about these particular individuals as well. And I also uh, did a lot of interviewing of families, a lot of interviewing. Uh, I had been working in southeastern Ghana since 1978, and I had gone back to the same communities over and over and over again. And in doing that, people were willing to talk about things that they might not be willing to talk about otherwise. If they didn't know me, if they didn't trust me. I'd already done one, two, three books. <laughs> And I have uh, on this area and the culture, and I had gone back to the area and I had given them copies of the book. I had the book launches of them there so that they could g give me some feedback as to how they were responding. So I had established a relationship with these communities. I had established a relationship with these families. And this was absolutely critical that you do this because slavery is a very, very sensitive topic, okay? In West Africa, people are willing to talk about the Atlantic slave trade. Yes, uh, there were these exports, and, uh, but domestic slavery is a very sensitive topic, and uh, being identified as a slave owner, knowing what happened to the people who were shipped out, also becomes a very sensitive topic. So I contacted the families uh, as I was writing this book, and I actually gave them uh, the right to stop me from publishing anything because I knew it was a sensitive topic. You never know what the uh, repercussions are if you're pu publishing something about a particular individual family. So I did that. And luckily for me, and perhaps for you, <laughs> they gave me permission. They said, it's fine, you know. So let me give you a little bit of information about each individual and show you why it's sensitive. So the first man that I did a biography of, his name was Amagashi Afaku. And he um, was a very prominent uh, religious leader. He was a wealthy businessman. Uh, wealth in many ways was determined by the number of slaves you owned and he was considered quite wealthy. He was very politically influential. He was one of the principal advisors to the political leader in this area in southeastern Ghana, where I was doing my work. So he was a very prominent individual. Uh, his response, when the British came in in 1875 and said, okay, slavery is over, and his reaction was, no way. <laughs> and what he did was he uh, lived on the coast in the town and moved all his people to outside British jurisdiction where they could reach them because the British were at that point were just on the coast. What happened, however, and why he shows up in the British records is that people kept on coming to the British and saying, I want to be free. I've been abused. I've been this, that, and the other. And let me tell you that the British and the French, they really were not really interested in abolition. They were coming in to colonize. They didn't want to disrupt the labor situation. They didn't want to disrupt the economy in a way that they could not then benefit themselves. So yes, they issued a decree, slavery is illegal. 
but they really didn't do much. But people started coming to them nevertheless. So that's why he shows up in the records. He also shows up because as people heard that slavery was outlawed, they began to decide that they wanted to go home. Those people who knew where they came from, who had been captured in war, said, okay, I'm free now, I'm going home. And, and in this case, Amagashi was so incensed about the whole thing that he heard that there was a caravan of people, they were missionaries, but they hired a bunch of former slaves because they were all going inland. And these individuals, they were gonna pay them to carry their goods. And once they dropped the goods off to wherever the missionaries were going, they could just go home. But Amagashi heard about this. None of these were his people, but he sent a whole group of men to attack them and then actually killed quite a few. So this gives you an indication of how opposed he was, you know, to the notion that slavery is over. He, uh, these weren't even his people who were trying to leave, you know, but as an institution, he's, he was adamantly uh, in support of maintaining it. What is interesting is I did the background about his individu this individual was to find out that he himself was of slave descent. That, and knowing, getting a lot of information about the culture at the time, anybody who was of slave descent was teased, was made to know that they were on the bottom in terms of the social s scale, that uh, they didn't have much respect, okay? And so this is the kinds of things that he experienced, and yet he was able to accumulate enough money, attach himself to a religious order and become a priest, and eventually become one of the most, uh, the closest advisors to the political leader. So he had, and then to, and then he used all of this wealth to buy a lot of people. And that's where, in a sense, the issue of speculation comes in. So my question is, is you know what it's like to be a slave. You know what it's like to be publicly humiliated and people not giving you much respect. Why are you uh, defending this institution? And what I speculate in this book is, is that he had managed to work the system for himself. He had, despite where he, he was, he had managed to rise up become very wealthy, very influential, et cetera, and he wasn't about to see this institution die, okay? Because that was the basis of his wealth and he was not prepared to shift and change. He tended to be kind of a violent person. I mean, he had a temper, you know? At the same time, he was very insecure about his status. So some of the accounts about him say that he was always demanding people respect. He was always making sure he had the best clothes, the most gorgeous cloth, et cetera. It all indicates that he, he was working through something. And that's what I suggest, that he, uh, he was marked by this status, and yet he had risen up through the system, taken advantage of the institutions that were there, and therefore he, um, he was not going to see the very society that he had managed to climb up to just fall apart, okay? He is unusual. Most slave owners, said, okay, in this case, the British have abolished slavery. If I don't change the way that I treat the people who are providing my labor, then they're gonna leave. They're gonna go off on their own. So a lot of people, most slave owners said, okay, uh, you are no longer our slaves, you're part of the larger family. You know, uh, They may keep a, a, a kind of a hidden transcripts, hidden record, of who was descendant from who, but they tried to kind of keep people together by giving them, by not being uh, uh, so nasty to them. And in fact, the political legal system enacted a law during this particular time which said that you cannot talk about someone's origins because they knew that if somebody insulted someone because they were a slave, then basically you're inviting this, this person to leave and go back home. And of course, at this time, labor is everything in terms of farming, producing wealth, et cetera.
What is interesting about Amagashi, not only is he rather unusual in resorting to this, but you could see this kind of attitude through the family. So as I mentioned, I interviewed a lot of family members. And some individuals said, well, we don't make any difference, you know. But one of the family leaders said, oh yeah, all those people on that land, those were our slaves. And now we call them family. You know, technically, I can't leave, the, I can't uh, push them out, you know. But clearly he was making a sharp distinction. We don't uh, see ourselves marrying into those people, you see. So you have that kind of element. The second individual was very different altogether. This man was by the name of Tamaklo. Um, very prominent family. Pro uh, Tamaklo was a military leader, very well respected military leader. Um, and along with the political leadership in his community decided that uh, in terms of uh, they could not withstand British colonialism. They didn't have the means, they didn't have the arms to resist it. So his attitude was that, okay, they're there. They bring certain things. There's some things that we don't like. They're things that we can use for our own benefit. He had this phrase that Europeans are like the sponge. If you use them, they'll make your skin nice and soft. <laughs> <laughs> and so his attitude was if we can't fight them, figure out a way to use them, you know. And so he hired a bunch of people who were clerks because he himself was illiterate. He invested in timber, he invested in mining, he invested in agriculture. He was very wealthy, he had lots of slaves, etc. But he took a very different approach than um, Amagashi. Uh, Tamaklo instead said, okay, I've got all of these people. This is the new normal now. We've got colonialism, you've got schools, you've got business. The language of business in this area was English. And because he owned a lot of land, he started giving land to various churches because the churches always uh, had a school attached to them. So he gave them to the Bremen Mission, which came in from Germany. He gave uh, land to the Catholic Church, et cetera, because they were going to have schools, and he wanted them to start teaching English. The other thing that he did, because that's going to, if he can get his people to learn English, that's going to help his business, right? And so he said to all of his slaves, and there were a lot, we don't know how many, but there were lots of them. He said, he stipulated that if I give land, to you, the Catholic Church, then all of my family, all of my children will go to school free. And as someone told me who I interviewed, all of these people who were Tamaklo slaves changed their name to Tamaklo and they went to school. <laughs> and he sent some of these people to England to become lawyers, to become doctors, and so in you can see that his approach was very different. He said, these are people who have skills. Some of them are very smart. I don't want them to leave, I want them, so I'm gonna give them a raisin for remaining and being attached and being proud of being part of the Tamaklo family, okay? And that's precisely what he did. Tamaklo is one of the largest, most educated families in Ghana. Uh, Jerry John Rawlings, who was, the, who was the president of Ghana, is a Tamaklo. <laughs> so, you know, you have some very famous clinics, Nyahu Clinic, you know, a man by doctors, et cetera. So it's very interesting to see this is a very different kind of approach, you know. And again, the question is, is why? For me, the question is, okay, I can document what he did, but the question is, is why? And, I realized that there were a number of elements in his life that may point to an answer. He was a military leader, and oftentimes the soldiers who he was commanded were slaves. If you were a wealthy person and you had a lot of slaves, you didn't go to war. You sent your slaves, okay? So 
he, and he was praised, and he clearly had some connection to the soldiers that he commanded. He um, often mourned about their loss, the losses that people were killed, okay? So that was one element. I mentioned that he was illiterate, but he had all these business dealings, investments in land, mining, timber, et cetera. The person who was his personal secretary was also of slave descent. And this individual was always constantly talking about, as an adult even, the humiliation of being of slave descent. Tomaclo had to know about this, okay? And I said, you know, the man seems to have had some feelings, you know, for people who were not at his level, because he was a very well-respected individual. He was free, you know, one of the from, from one of the founding families of the entire area. In addition, he had many wives, because that was typical. You have, you have a lot of money, you have a lot of wives. Some of his wives, a number of his wives, were captured in war, okay? And I couldn't quite identify all of them. But when, he, when one of his wives died, he was so affected. She had converted to Christianity. So he said in, just before his death, he converted to Christianity so he could be with her. What year? We're talking about the late 19th, early 20th century. Okay, that period, okay. So here you have a man who is doing, uh, who has some feelings for people, no matter what their social status is, you know. And it also transmits to the future generations. The future generations, they have to, he was a chief, a very prominent chief. And so the question is, is who is going to succeed him on this prominent position? And the family decided after some time that it didn't matter whether you were of slave descent or free, you were gonna go with the best person, the most capable person to hold this position. And of course, he's the one who also set the standard for that as well. He was a very remarkable man, really interesting, you know. So I'm just gonna focus on those two. The third individual uh, was a farmer, uh, a businessman involved in trade, uh, suffered a great deal um, and eventually converted to Christianity and uh, also not, uh, freed his slaves because that was what was expected of a Christian, okay? So you have three very different individuals taking three very different paths um, as to how they're going to make the adjustment to the abolition of slavery. And after each chapter, each biography, I look at the repercussions up to today, particularly within those families, okay, to see how you have a legacy that continues to this day. Amagashi left a legacy in his family, and other families who made similar decisions also left a legacy. Tamaklo also left his own legacy, and so, uh, when you talk about slavery today in Ghana, again, it's a very sensitive topic. No one really wants to talk about it because you could eventually divide families and get families pitted against each other. So it's a very sensitive kind of thing, and yet the legacies are there, okay? One of the things that I do is to look not only at these families and not only what is happening in Ghana, but it was happening in other parts of West Africa. So for example, if you look at the kinds of decisions that Amagashi made, you see them replicated elsewhere. In some areas of Northern Mali, for example, uh, there is still discrimination, and this is a Muslim area, there is still discrimination against people of slave descent. Uh, people of slave descent have to sit in the back of the mosque on Friday prayers. They can't be in front. Women are not allowed to cover their hair as a sign of modesty and religion. People of slave descent, they may get religious education, 
but they will never ever get a post as a religious leader in that home community because they know of the person's background, you know. And yet in other places, families were making some of the same decisions as Tomaclo. It doesn't matter, you know. We're all in this together, you know. So it's very, for me, it was very interesting to see this legacy, you know. It's there, it's present uh, in a variety of forms and very few people ever want to talk about it. So I was lucky enough that people were willing to talk to me and to share what they had to say uh, about their own families and allowing me to publish them. So that's a brief overview of the book. <laughs> so questions? Yes. Okay. Is that better? Okay. Yes. For the part of for the area of Africa that you studied, uh, as it as it headed more toward a freeing up of uh, slave or getting rid of the slave um, institution, would you say that how much impact Liberia, the founding of Liberia, maybe had on neighboring countries in that area? Not so much. Um, the fact is, is that people can. There's the legal abolition of slavery. But because there's money involved and labor is important, people find a way to get around it. So even though Liberia, for example, was founded by African Americans, freed people who came to Africa, some of them began to also engage in contract labor, which was another form of slavery. Having contracts send them off to Fernando Po and Island uh, get the money for it and forget about it, you know. So wherever there's money involved, you're going to find it. Uh, I mean, there is slavery. Slavery is supposedly dead, but it's as alive as you can believe, you know. Uh, whether it's trafficking of women, whether it's uh, kidnapping and trafficking of children, uh, some would, people would say the 13th Amendment in the United States Constitution allows slavery for people who have committed a crime, and in fact it is, that's what the 13th Amendment says, you know. Therefore, you have prisoners who are making underwear for Victoria's Secrets for 10 cents an hour, you know, that kind of thing. So everywhere, if you can make money off of people, it's going to continue, even if it's officially illegal. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, you made the point at the beginning. Sorry. You made the point at the beginning that there were no women slave owners, oh, or were. at least the ones that you were mm -hmm. looking to document. Mm -hmm. uh, could you? say a little bit about that, uh, why they were not up to be part of this special documentation. Yeah. But at the same time, suppose they were, I mean, they were, as you said, women's slave owners. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to tell us how they came to be like that? What was the status of women at those t mm -hmm. days? Thank you. Okay. So in terms of uh, slave, women slave owners, yes, they existed. Uh, women were often involved in business. There was no system or culture that says that you can't engage in business. In fact, women were encouraged to have a little bit of income on the, of their own. Um, so they existed, but uh, we are reliant on both oral histories and documentary sources. The documentary sources were written by Europeans, and the Europeans saw themselves as the men being more important, and those are the people who they're going to interact with, and those are the people who they're going to write about. I did collect some oral histories, but they just weren't enough in order to do a full biography. You know, uh, they just it just it wasn't. So women, uh, the role of women, that's a big topic. Uh, and I think you need to distinguish between, instead of all women, is to kind of categorize them. So 
Women who are postmenopausal have a certain status. Women who are, uh, uh, you know, childbearing have another status, and of course, children have yet another status. Uh, women associated with uh, royalty and have a, a separate status unto themselves as opposed to everybody else. And then you, of course, have women who were slaves. And in fact, within Africa, we know that there were more women slaves than men. Even looking at the looking at domestic slavery as opposed to uh, the export, twice as many men, men were exported into the transatlantic slave trade than uh, women, twice as many boys as girls. And most societies have a fairly even ratio. So if, and, and warfare tends to, uh, in this context, they're trying to capture anybody and everybody. It's not about killing. It's about capturing as many people as you can. You either ship them out to the Atlantic slave trade or you hold them for ransom so that their families will pay a ransom, but it's a basically a money-making, you use it as a money-making deal, right? And so if you have warfare that is capturing everybody, as many people as possible, and you have this kind of ratio of males to females being exported, it suggests that there were many more women who were enslaved locally than uh, were being exported. And that gave rise to uh, uh, wealthy men who have multiple wives. And in this area, there's a saying that uh, only a poor man has one wife. <laughs> you know, so you have to look at these different, uh, disaggregate, you know, the category of woman and, and determine what status they have within the society itself, because that determines what their opportunities are. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. I missed the first part. I apologize. So I don't know how you laid out your beginning. Mm -hmm. But coming at this from literature, I'm thinking of Amatai Do's yes. play Anua, yeah. where she deals with that question. Mm -hmm. um, and a more recent novel, mm -hmm. Homegoing, which mm -hmm. deals with a few generations. Right. So I'm wondering, and actually I was reading a poem in class yesterday by Abena called, uh, called Achimota, which deals uh -huh. with the school Mm -hmm. which used to be a place of refuge for people being enslaved. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering if you work with some of those hierarchies and then where do the transatlantic slaves, so-called enslaved people, fit into your scheme? In terms of when far, they... In terms of your, your, the pattern that you laid out. I missed the first part, so you may have already done that. I didn't really deal so much with the transatlantic slave trade and people returning, uh, which is a long history of people returning. I think uh, there have actually been some very good things written about that. I would say that in many places, uh, if you're an American, it's assumed you have money. And, and, and money means that you are accorded a certain amount of respect. And, um, uh, and so it's a bit more complex than that, you know. What? I didn't understand. More complex than? Than uh, simply, uh, Africans, African Americans returning to the diaspora, you know. Uh, Africa, African Americans are uh, seen as Americans first, as people who have the money to return, people who can feed the uh, uh, heritage tourism trade, etc. But then, of course, there are whole people like me <laughs> who was married to a Ghanaian and who was deeply involved in you know, local culture, et cetera, and that's a whole nother group too. You know, so. no, I was wondering about the category slave that you were using, if you put in those hierarchies in, in your discussion. Where they would, yeah. I guess I'm not quite, so if somebody came back from Brazil, where would they fit? Yeah, in your framework, where, you know, you talked about slaves, which I caught as I came and I said the play. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering in your framework, are you creating a hierarchy of the enslaved at all, or are you just, is your category slave just? Oh, I did not open? create a, I see what you're saying. I did not make any kinds of distinctions. Okay. There are distinctions based on the wealth of the individual with whom you are attached. So if somebody abuses you and you tell your master, and he's a very prominent person, and he gets upset, then they have to deal with him. <laughs> 
you know, so in that sense, it's a relationship, you know. Um, yes. And then I'll come to you. Yeah. Yeah, so in the beginning, you talked about Amegashi, mm -hmm. and you said uh, he moved in inland when, like, the British came to the coast. Did you, did you find any specific place in Ghana where he moved to? Oh, definitely. Okay, so uh, where did he move <laughs> to? Aferengba. Where? Aferengba. Afia Dengba. Yeah, Afia Dengba. Yeah, that's where he moved. Yeah. You know that place. Yeah. <laughs> Um, continuing on the, the Atlantic slave trade, was there any opinion by any of these slave owners about what was going on in the United States regarding slavery? Um, in another book, I looked at the movement of African Americans back to this area, and so um, they were aware uh, they were educating people as to the fact that they came originally from Africa, right? But it was like, really? <laughs> you know, it didn't, it didn't quite register. And I think those who were involved in the trade, that's not their concern as to what was happening to these people. They were being uh, bought. They were being sold. And it's all about transactions and money. Yeah. So then the... the and it's not that, one of the other things that I've done, it's not like people were totally um, and, uh, uh, resistant to seeing the suffering of people. I've collected songs, I've collected uh, poetry, uh, et cetera, uh, proverbs that talk about and sympathize with these kinds of situations. But it was the way the place you know, it was, this, it was the larger system that was operating. Yeah. Uh, I think she was next, and then, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, as you know, I'm just really, really interested in your process of, um, your research process as mm -hmm. a historian and as an anthropologist. Mm -hmm. And um, I wonder, in collecting your oral histories. Um, I'm thinking about the period of time passing. It's at least 75 years to maybe 150 years mm -hmm. after some of the, let's call them events, mm -hmm. uh, moments that you're sort of trying to record in some ways. Right. And um, you're talking to a number of people who are generations removed from the, the, right. the, the meat of of what you want to get to. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm wondering about um, if you could describe your process and your thoughts about how you are um, rationalizing or how you are um, thinking about multiple narratives and coming up with what you think is the, 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 <laughs> the sort of, the, the narrative that you want to record. Mm -hmm. And, um, and you also talked about some of your other sources that you're using mm -hmm. and how you uh, work among all of those narratives mm -hmm. and how you come up with what you think is, is the, um, I, I won't say the truth, but the, the, the sort of most, most important um, kernel of information that you want to arrive at. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just, I am just totally floored by the amount of work that you are doing to bring all of these histories together and how important it is. And I, and I suspect, I don't know, but I suspect that um, collecting these narratives is very rare and isn't done very often. And maybe you could speak to how, uh, how many other historians are doing this kind of work. You. Oh, <laughs> I don't want to put anybody down, <laughs> but uh, historians of Africa often say, oh, we're going to do this, and, you know, uh, there were, uh, African history, uh, its modern form of, uh, which began really in the 1950s, uh, in which uh, people were collecting materials um, 
really became well known for doing oral work. Okay. Uh, the fact is, is that not people say they collect this and that and the other, but the fact is, is that most don't. You know. Uh, so there's a lot of lip service, you might say. Uh, when I think about my research, the fondest memories I have are living in these communities, talking to people, being part of their lives. I mean, I just loved it, <laughs> you know. I mean, it's wonderful. You make connections, you get to know people, you know, you know it just, it was just, uh, uh, I, could, I could go on about particular incidences and you say something and, it, and uh, you're surprised by the reaction, or you go to another community, and they say, well, you're living here, so obviously you're biased, so I'm not gonna to talk to you because you've already made up your mind. So, I mean, it was very interesting. I think what is critical to understand about collecting oral histories is in an area where the society is very much still, even though it's literate, there's a strong culture of oral transmission and oral culture that it's remarkable what people remember. And so what I have done is I've collected those oral histories. I have triangulated them against documentary sources, whether they're British sources, whether they're Danish sources, in my case, or German sources. And you look at all of that, and it's, it's always striking to see what people remember and how accurate it is, you know. So I have collected oral traditions about wars, in the 18th century. And they have detailed information about who they were fighting for, won, lost, etc. They might have forgotten why they fought the war, but then you look at the, in this case, the Danish material, and it's all there. You know, it's all there. So uh, it's when you have oral material and you don't, can't figure out exactly what to do with it, how to verify it. That's become the problem. But because this area was on the coast and you have lots of people coming through, uh, you've got enough written sources that can, you can mesh with the oral materials and you can make a lot of sense of the history. But it does take uh, going and getting sources from many different places. You know. Does that answer your fully? You know, there are not too many people who focus on the early periods anymore, you know. Um, I have to say no. It's rather unique. I mean, um, it's different, you know. And I was lucky in the sense that the people in this community decided that their history was important. And so individuals really took interest in maintaining that history and keeping that history going. You see it being recounted in court cases. Oh, the court cases. <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, and then you have to weave through that because, of course, in a court you're trying to achieve certain, now who's really telling the truth here when they're fighting over a piece of land, you know? But still, the stuff is there, and it's there to work with, whereas in some areas it just doesn't exist anymore. Young people didn't take any interest, old people have died, and they, the information has gone with them. This area is really remarkable, you know. We have time for one more question. <laughs> I think he uh, had his... Thank you. So um, with regard to uh, slavery, like local slavery within West Africa, like before the British and French got there, were there set laws that kind of um, like, were there like written laws with regard to the institution, or was it more of like kind of a de facto thing? There were. The war. Pardon? Who lost the war? No, he was talking about the legal system. Yeah, so like, was there a legal system in place? Um, yes, for there was. Slavery before the British and French got there? There was a legal system in place. Law. Yeah, but there were, there, there were local laws, you know. Uh, there were definitely local laws, and they were uh, accepted gradations of punishments for those laws, for those, for breaches of those laws. Yeah, there was a legal system in place, you know. What happened, just to build on this, what happened once you have the British and French coming in, 
is that people objected to the idea that you're coming in and you're imposing your laws on us when we already have laws. So you have a mesh of uh, what you might call traditional law or local law with British common law. And, uh, and it's interesting to see how courts use those laws to this day. So there's a quote in my book of a legal case in which a very prominent um, chief, chief of Mampong, um, was up for, that. he was, there was a dispute, King had died, there were competing uh, interests in who was gonna be in this particular position. Uh, one branch took another branch to court to say that this individual did not have a legal right to do it because he was a descendant of a slave and the Supreme Court upheld it, you know. So that's what I mean by the continuing legacy, you know. So it's there, you know. You have a court case in Mali that was the same kind of thing and eventually the court in Mali was going to old, uphold it because it's traditional law, but then eventually the uh, Echoes court overturned it. You know, so there's a competing uh, legal systems here, and the and the they have to figure out how they're going to mesh all this together and make their judgments. Yeah.